All right, I say we just get started. Um, cool. I think we got a good group of people here. Um, all right, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome friends of the sun, as Hannes would say. Hannes is running a bit late today. Um, he's coming, he's um, on his way back from a presentation. And so I'm gonna start off uh, by moderating the first part. My name is Ezra. I am a, I'm an MN student in Hannes' lab. Um, and without further ado, um, we have the honor of talking to uh, Lazar uh, Atena Akovic. Uh, about his paper, Meta Flow Matching, Integrating Vector Fields on the Wasserstein Manifold. Uh, so yeah, let me pass it over to you, Lazar. Uh, you want to just introduce yourself and um, yeah. and then we can get Thanks, started. Sir. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I'm yep. Lazar. I'm a PhD student coming towards the end of my degree. I'm Brennan Fry and Bo Wang's groups at University of Toronto Vector Institute. And kind of my research focus has been in this realm of dynamics and cells and cell trajectories and understanding cellular systems, uh, but much more in the machine learning perspective, contextualized by these problems in biology. Um, so with that comes this paper, meta flow matching, and kind of a spoiler alert for those that haven't read the paper is we look at these biological systems where we can model uh, development of particles or cells um, respect to their entire distributions and interactions. And this is kind of the gist of this work, and we'll show an application of this in predicting um, cancer treatment response and argue why it's important to have these kind of models. And this is this is kind of a high-level summary. And yeah, with that, I'll, I'll jump into the presentation. And yeah, as we kind of discuss with those others coming in now late, um, by all means, stop me with questions any anytime in the presentation. I think this is a better way to stimulate discussion. Also, no one gets lost throughout the presentation. But hopefully, nothing I introduced today is too complicated. I'm keeping it very easygoing and, and, and as simple as I can to um to kind of get the message across. Okay, cool. Great. So, sounds good. Thanks. So to uh, just give some background motivation for everything, um, well, we're interested in, in many scientific problems. Um, we have this problem of understanding how dynamics dynamics of many bottom problems or the dynamics of evolutions of, of interacting particles behave and how, how these particles evolve. And as is mentioned, my domain is kind of contextualized by these biological problems. And something we've been interested in is how um, dynamic processes of cells undergo with respect to their environment interactions with each other. Um, um, and then many models kind of do this, but don't really uh, capture these interactions or don't really capture these distribution dependent responses. And this is kind of the details we'll go into. And to give you kind Wait, of- So just, just say, I don't mean, to, uh, is it okay if I just ask a clarifying yeah, question please, about this please, picture please. right here? So, so the, this is kind of like the prototypical system that we're looking at, right? We have this like kind of this like transport of this cell population. My question is, so where does this actually like, is where do these data sets come from? Is it we take, we have some like culture of cells in vitro and we kind of, we measure the population somehow without, um, without destroying it or without touching it. And then we let it evolve under some, you know, treatment or some drug or something. And then we measure it after some fixed amount of time. Is that kind of the idea? Mostly correct. The only thing that um, that that we always have to account for is you can't measure these cells without destroying them. So so these marginals okay. P zero P one P T they're different instances of cells. You're never measuring the same cell twice in the setup. But otherwise, everything you said is correct. You kind of have these in vitro in vitro cells, um, or cell line or cell population. You measure them, and then you can measure them at different time points. So you would have multiple multiple kind of uh, uh, patient oh, dishes. Okay, I see. And you yeah, measure and you one them at, at zero time. and one. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, this That's is sense. how you would essentially do it to to kind of get this. So so with this comes this whole plethora of, of optimal transfer methods, arguing that we need to need to kind of match ideally uh, cells from these different populations. Um, is there? Uh, oh, I was just going to say I don't. Uh, let, let me know if I'm ever cutting you off if you're in the middle of a oh, point okay. and you just okay. I was going to ask, um, and maybe we'll get to this, but is there any reason that we should suspect that like the evolution of these cell populations would follow some optimal transport map? Like, is there any reason to suspect that this is actually a useful way of modeling these things? Yeah. So in this work, we don't consider optimal transport. It's not the focus of this work. And there is, I have many of these conversations of, of this assumption. And to me, it's not obvious. Others will argue that yes, we can come up with counterexamples where we can argue that OT is the right thing to consider, but, um, Overall, it, it, to me, it's not like definitive. Um, and okay, again, awesome. maybe some people disagree with me, but um, for the context of this work, there is OT extensions that we can consider in the future, but we don't we don't discuss OT here. 
we kind of just consider these these unpaired cells or particles in this camp. But we we an assumption we do consider is that these distributions, so P zero and P one, they're paired, and I'll kind of get into these details. Gotcha. Um, okay, kind of, awesome. Let's get into it. So you know to give a big picture of the applications of these these kind of models and and kind of what we want to do here is. And one particular area of focus that we're interested in is understanding treatment response in cancer cells. And there's two components of this that, that are interesting. One is these cancer cells, they interact with each other. So their response might depend um, on their environment and as well as is their interaction with each other when there's a treatment uh, uh, um, perturbed or stimulated on them. And to this end, understanding these interactions is, is, is an interesting problem and actually like a prevalent problem in biology that people are trying to do with this kind of cell-cell communication or cell interaction. And a secondary thing is if we look at kind of patients, um, different patients themselves might have different responses to treatments. And you can think of this kind of at the distributional level that um, different distributions of cells can be in, representative in different environments. And you put a treatment in each of these different patients or distributions, and you might get a slightly different response and also go into the details. So these are the two kind of primary aspects we want to capture. And then another application that I haven't worked in, but have thought about, uh, I know others have sort of started working in this, um, is understanding kind of developments of these cells, but in the spatial regime, this kind of figure on the right, where, where we know there's some spatial structure and there's some development over time. And we know this, this, this space is preserved or how cells develop depending on the space interactions around them. So these are kind of high level applications of biology that you can maybe consider when, as I go through kind of the abstractions of this work. So this is our we question. thinking of, oh, keep going, sorry. Sorry, yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead, ask the question. I was gonna be asking, like, so should we think, cause I'm looking at this picture right here with the, yeah. the this kind of, this blue cell, um, um, so undergoing some transformation. This is like kind of a view on a particular cell volume. So is the idea that we're viewing these population changes as like some statistic of the or some kind of statistical view on the evolution of a single a single cell, like because I imagine um, you could also ask like if I have this particular cell and I add a drug, like what happens to it as like a question about this one particular cell rather than right. how does this population change as like a, yeah we're looking at population in this okay gotcha this be, uh, and a lot of these methods kind of consider or a lot of existing methods consider at the population level again a big reason for this is this destructive sampling process so not being able to kind of sample the same cell twice. If we could do this, we could kind of decipher the dynamics of individual cells. But this is a fundamental limitation of these, these kind of biological data sets is we, we have this destructive process. So we, we treat things at the population level for this reason. Okay. Gotcha. Um, good news is we can sample a lot of cells. So this kind of population level thing makes a lot of sense in, in the sense, or, or is, it's approachable. Um, but, but with this all being said, this is kind of the main question is at the population level, we want to try to model the evolution of these cells, but also considering these interactions um, uh, between the cells or particles more abstractly, as well as these distribution specific or population specific responses. So these are the two elements we want to capture. And as kind of I've alluded to, we have many of these methods that do these population dynamics of these cells um, um, now at this point, uh, many have come up with this, but a lot of these methods only assume um, evolution of independent particles. So there's no interaction models. And similarly, we would also like to capture this kind of distribution dependent response. And in a similar vein, a lot of these methods that we already have typically only assume um, um, or can at best condition a different dynamics or different conditions, but don't really capture the entire environment or population um, that it, it, these models are placed in or the cells go, go through. Um, and I think these are two very important things in, in the context of biology. And these are the two kind of primary aims of our work. So to just briefly go over the problem set up and more so just I'm repeating what I'm saying, but we want to model the, the interactions and we want to model the distribution dependent response. And there's two key assumptions that we're making in this work. The first being that we have these coupled distribution or marginal pairs or, or experiments that you can consider and I'll also use the term environment um, where, where you know what I denote here by color is you might have some different treatment responses um, um, denoted by time one at that marginal um, in different colors. You have different treatments, but they're all being placed in the same population environment denoted by the color. Um, this is one assumption we have is that these coupled population pairs. Um, and then the secondary assumption that we're making is that our data goes some, under some universal development process that, that involves the interaction of particles. Um, and this is a reasonable assumption in cells where we kind of know this, this behavior happens. And there's other examples in physics elsewhere, but I'm not an expert in that. So I'm not going to allude to those examples. Um, 
Any questions on the assumptions? I have an example for the second assumption. I think the first one might be clear, but the second one, I think. Uh, Just I can uh, to be perfectly yes. clear, for the first assumption, this means that you essentially had uh, multiple time points or just two time points uh, for the same culture. And so, uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, yeah, because the cells are distracted, uh, but you sub you only sample part of the population and the rest of the population keeps evolving. So you assume that there is a uh, continuity between time points. Yes. Yes, if I understand what you're saying, um, but the one caveat is in in our work here, it is extendable to multiple time points. Um, our data sets are just two time points in in the context of MFM or what we had here, but yeah, you okay. can't extend you. beyond that. And then one more one more question here is: so this yeah. index is actually factoring into like different cell lines per 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 like person in this trial from which this data was generated, as well as just different people. Yeah, yeah, great question. Yeah, so so index I is like a population index. We call it a population index. So it'll it'll kind of factor in like um, a different patient or a different cell line or cell culture. Gotcha. Um, okay. right. um, in the context of this work, we have each patient has, and I'll kind of explain the data when we get there. Each patient has kind of replicated experiments. So it really represents some replicated experiment within a patient population. Um, but we can leave out an entire patient for test data to kind of have this effect of generalization across patients. Um, and, I'll, and I'll get into those details when we get there. So, awesome. you know, to kind of give a concrete example of what this assumption looks like is, you know, we can define some some system of interacting particles. And, you know, in this mean field limit of interacting particles, you can define a velocity that describes how particle X evolves in interaction with particle uh, Y. And you can write the continuity equation that describes this and simulate a very similar simple system of this and maybe it's not very obvious in this in this gift that the particles themselves are interacting but this is just some visualization or abstract visualization to kind of show this behavior of this of this assumption as you can define this universal development process where these interactions exist so this in this case we we have an inductive bias about how our things interact and we are solving for this probability path pt based on these things precisely but kind of hoping that p1 will be kind of the are measured P1 in some sense. We think yes. they'll be close. Okay. Yeah, precisely. So obviously, in the biological data, we don't actually know the ideal um, interactions and in velocity and vector field, but we're assuming these these inductive biases and hoping that this helps us improve performance. Okay. So now the question is: Is we want to train a model to be able to learn this, and how do we how do we do this? And to just very briefly review, this is probably a review for a lot of people: is we're going to use flow matching. And essentially in flow matching, we're kind of considering these continuous interpolations between the marginals. Um, they can be linear, they can be some other function like OT interpolations, et cetera. And in a similar sense, we can define this uh, corresponding density um, um, from here. And the essential component of flow matching is this continuity equation, which lets us describe the change in density with respect to some vector field. And from this, we can derive an objective um, to kind of approximate this, this vector field with some parameterized function. And we can derive this now with the great uh, flow matching objective where we can regress directly to some assumed vector field um, and train a neural net that models this, this, this parameterized vector field and to learn some, some uh, function that describes this push forward of the probability distributions or the densities. But, uh, you know, this, this vanilla case is, you know, great, but, you know, we can't condition or we can't model these interactions and we can't condition on these populations that we want to. So the question is, how can we now devise a, a framework where we can use flow matching and learn these vector fields that also condition on, on the populations themselves, as well as um, model interaction. So, so I'll start with how we condition on populations and I'll describe how we model interactions in, in uh, some oncoming slides. But Essentially, we can write the continuity equation where the vector field itself also depends on, on the distribution at time t. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to learn some vector field model that, that now has a representation of this distribution at time t, um, where we denote this, this, this phi here as some, some function that learns a representation or embedding for some, some measure or input distribution that I denote as pi. Um, and this is what we call an embedding module model or a population embedding model is what we use throughout the paper a lot. And essentially it's learning and embedding for this joint density um, of marginals or samples at times zero and one, given the population index um, that we discussed, I, 
um, where we know that these marginals are coupled. Um, and what's important to know is that, you know, in many applications, we actually don't know this, this distribution P of I. So this, this indiction, uh, this, um, a condition or this population index is usually unknown. So we this is a hence why we want to kind of in one way uh, learn an embedding for this um, on top of capturing the environment itself. Um, any questions on this? Uh, I have a quick one. Um, yes. I was wondering how do you actually uh, represent the entire distribution of T? Uh, this P of T? Yeah. Or like, oh, like exactly. you're talking about how we how we like learn this or like what the embedding model is or how we learn the mm -hmm. embedding model. Correct. So the embedding model, and I'll get into detail, it's a permutation variant function. So we use a GCN or a deep set model is another example. We have an ablation for this. In this sense, so when we okay. sample batches of these particles, um, um, you know, the permutation of the samples doesn't uh, uh, determine, you know, the, what distribution index we're coming from. Um, and then we devise an objective based on flow matching to kind of learn this. And we have a theorem in the paper, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, suggests that we will converge um, um, when we train this way. I don't know if this answers Makes your sense. question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the key is the fact that we're using this permutation invariant architecture um, for fee. And I'll kind of discuss this more in the coming slides. So, um, so in this case, you're embedding this joint density over X0 and X1, so, as opposed to, I remember the papers talking about just X0. Is this, yeah. is this? Yeah, sorry, this this is the caveat. So so yes, you okay. can do this over any time point. Um, you can condition on any distribution, but we focus um, um, just on the initial population. And I think uh, I'll go into some intuition of why we do this. Um, and why we think this could be enough, but I think in reality, it would be nice to extend this and probably helpful. It's not trivial, I think, to extend this. Maybe it is, but not to me. It's not quite obvious right away, but it might require some some work on the algorithm to, to kind of easily do this in a computational manner. But yeah, and the focus of this paper is kind of learning these embeddings for uh, P0, so, so the initial population. And you can right. kind of think of this as an initial condition of the dynamic system, which I'll which we'll get to um, now. Yeah, so so some intuitive example of why this makes sense and the way I think about this problem and why we want to do it this way is if you kind of assume that there's some system, some dynamical system defined by some differential equation. In this case, I'm using this very simple linear differential equation to describe this system or a system. And you try to solve the system, you kind of get a, a family of solutions. And this family of solution depends on some, some initial conditions. But in general, without initial conditions, we have this constant usually that, that depending on the value of the constant, um, the dynamics change. And given different initial conditions, you're given different solutions of the dynamics. And the way I like to view this is these different patients or different populations um, from different patients can be viewed as different initial conditions. So to this end, if we're able to kind of well capture these initial populations that describe the environments or the initial conditions, we have a better uh, uh, patient-specific or population-specific dynamic uh, model for for these systems and and with this end you can now you know if you see a perturbation you see like a treatment in in, in both populations or in, in a handful of populations then now what you're trying to generalize over instead of generalizing over treatments which some people try to do or perturbations we're generalizing over a new population or a new patient which here we can you know because we have the data for it we can we can we can frame a problem this way i don't know if this is entirely clear what i've described um so I, I'm going to stop if anyone has any questions. So in this case, there's kind of this modeling assumption that with actual like cellular transport data, there's kind of this like injective mapping from our initial population to our, I guess what we're calling our treated thing. Is this, is this kind of why, or why do we think this is like a good, uh, a safe assumption for this kind of data? So I think in general, when you have two different cell populations, um, you'll never, well, you can argue that it's very unlikely that both populations were, are going to be in the absolutely exact same state. Um, okay. And because of this, you can kind of view it as they have different initial conditions. Now, to be fair, different, different, like if you have the same cell line, and you have in vitro models, like maybe they'll be more similar. But I think it's a fair argument for patients that, you know, you have very diverse populations of patients, especially in clinical trials sometimes. So given this, um, these patients might be in different initial conditions in this abstract view. Um, I see. Okay, so we've looked at a bunch of argue. stuff. They all look different. And yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Like age right, is cool. a great example. Different, you know, so on, so forth. Different medication protocols, different lives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Okay. Cool. Awesome. So this brings us to kind of metaflow matching. Um, how do we do this? So as I mentioned, we consider this data set of coupled of coupled marginals or coupled experiments. Uh, for population index i, and we're saying we have n of these. Um, 
So now the key thing is, you know, you know, and actually I'll get, I'll get to this a couple of slides, but the idea is we want to kind of generalize over, over these, these populations. And now the only information we have um, is samples from each population. So we want to learn a Medi model from these samples that represent the population itself. And then we can condition on these samples rather than just the index. And this is this embedding module phi, which as I described is some permutation invariant module uh, model that lets us capture this uh, distribution of uh, particles or cells. And then we can write our objective, uh, very similar to flow matching um, with addition of this condition on this population embedding module. So now we're learning two sets of parameters. We're learning the parameters for our vector field and we're learning the parameters for our embedding module. And we can actually do this jointly, which is another innovation of this work is we're, we're showing that we can um, um, optimize both of these parameters with this one objective and achieve um, generalization or improve generalization rather than doing this naively, um, which I think is quite cool. Um, is and this better than like like learning the like learning to embed your different cell populations before you do your film matching? Is that so like this a is a great question? Um, and I think so. We haven't explored thoroughly why it, what it, which one is better. I haven't we haven't explored this. So okay. I think it's like a future we like future work. Uh, okay. But this is a totally re relevant question. Maybe there is, you know, an argument for a foundation model, right? Where you learn a foundation, a foundation model over a bunch of populations or patients or different different initial conditions, if you will, many of them. But the 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 caveat there is, you know, the data points themselves, and this is kind of this intuitive example I want to show here. They're entire distributions. They're not just single uh, single samples. To this end, you know, having a massive data set um, that to pre-train on is not not like easy to acquire. Uh, because we're not talking about just having uh, millions of data points. We're talking about having millions of distributions. Um, and this kind of intuitive example of what metaflow matching, in a sense, does is this, this Wasserstein or distributional regression where we're regressing not just data points, but these entire distributions. There's uh, um, another intuitive way to think of what, what MFM is trying to, trying to accomplish. I see, I see. Um, you, maybe, just maybe to play, I or keep going, yeah. Yeah, any questions on this? Sorry, maybe this is a good point too ask as they just to play devil's advocate like i guess you could argue Please. that if you only have a small number of of samples and like perhaps your kind of learned population embeddings are sort of being overfit so that the flow matching works out um or something like that um right is there is that a potential worry or maybe it's not i i'm just i'm kind of i'm just I'm uh, say, I don't just know. kind of poking at it no i think that's a reasonable question i don't know i don't know the answer though but 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 you know it's kind of I kind of I think we have a section of future work here that this is a reasonable direction of future work is like uh, uh, exploring to what degree you know changing the way you learn these embeddings from populations affects altogether this kind of approach. Um, awesome. I don't know That's if MSM is ideal, and I don't know if there's a better way to do it. And I think this is a totally reasonable direction to 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 look into. Um, cool. And maybe others hey, are right. Yeah, how's it going, Darn? Um, what's up? I was curious about the embedding thing as well. So do you think one of the boosts that you get by learning the embedding during the flow matching training is because of the um, like interpolants? Like you're, I, I guess it would be challenging to learn how to embed like XT between X0 and X1 because it's not like part of your data, but it's like simulated during the flow matching, right? So maybe because you're also learning on this like XT, this like fastitious data that doesn't really exist, you're actually getting like improved performance based on just learning like an embedding model on real populations. Yes, I I, I would like to think that. I, I I agree with this point. I had a friend from Causality help me, you know, or frame to that um, that I didn't even originally see, but there is potentially an argument to be made that MFM doing this jointly has beneficial. Uh, it is beneficial, but I'm not, I'm not convinced yet, but I think like, yeah, yeah. In a sense, this, this operating on this interpolated path, um, helps, but I think because we're only considering the, um, the initial distribution that it's hard to make a claim in this mm -hmm. setting, but I think if yeah, we yeah. extend it to, to actually conditioning on, um, P at time T, um, and, yeah. and we interpolate samples and then we use the distribution in the interpolated path, then what you're saying is true. Um, I think okay. this is the only caveat. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I think Thanks. I think this is the two like interesting things to explore in extension. Um, 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 or the most interesting things is kind of extending to conditioning over the entire interpolated path and observing or um, investigating how different pre-training on these population embeddings and even different architectures in the population embeddings. We we only consider yeah, it like GCN, um, just for simplicity. But I think there's definitely room for improvement there. Mm -hmm.
one other question I had, uh, and actually, if we need a, if there are more slides and you keep going, let me know and I'll, I can mm -hmm. cut this short. I was just curious as to like, um, so I know that the paper talks about referencing these, like this deep sets paper, which I haven't had the opportunity to read yet, mm -hmm. but I, I'm sort of thinking about like what we would want out of a good embedding for kind of our population. And like, it seems like you would want something that like, kind of like as your population size goes to infinity, like the variance of your embedding as a function of like drawing samples mm -hmm. from your population goes to zero or like you want your embedding function to be some like continuous in the underlying continuous distribution. Right. It, is this, I guess, I, I don't know. Is this, is this like something that we know is true for this particular, I guess there's like a GNN architecture here. Um, like if maybe I draw, you know, I only take yeah, three I'm samples not, or something, there's probably going to be a lot of. Yeah. I'm not an expert on, on, on graph neural networks. So I, I can't, I'm probably not well positioned to actually answer this question, but regarding the deep set. So what we explored is we kind of explored the effect of interactions um, when we're learning this, when we're using the population embedding model. So no interactions is kind of the deep set model. So it lets us learn a representation for a distribution because it's permutation invariant, but it doesn't model interactions where this GCN we model at varying degrees of interactions by varying this hyperparameter K for this KNN edge pooling layer. Um, to the end of learning the actual embeddings in an adequate manner, I'm not sure. I don't think, I don't know how to answer that one. Oh um, yeah, no worries. That's and that's, that's kind of tangent to this work. So no worries. Yeah. Um, my last like small question is, does the meta have anything to do with, I know some of the co-authors were at meta. Is there any? Yeah. I mean, no, I no, 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 but, but it's definitely so, so Brandon Amos, he, uh, he had a paper meta optimal transport. So it's, it's inspired by that where, you know, it's meta in the sense that, you know, we're kind of, we're learning things on the distributional space. Uh, hi, Brandon. How's it going? Uh, <laughs> learning things on the distributional space um, rather than just in samples. Maybe, maybe Brandon, you you have a better answer for the meta of this all. Uh, no, that's not uh, at all by meta. Absolutely no connection to the, okay. the affiliation okay. there. <laughs> just that it's meta, meta in the sense of solving many, many at the same time, right? It's like learning how to solve or learning how to solve these uh, flow, flow, many flow matching problems. Yeah, can, can I hunch. still That's ask uh, once again, maybe? Um, yes, please. So we, we are doing Wasserstein uh, manifold regression, right? So, and yeah. you say that each data point is a distribution. So I assume this is a distribution for a single uh, cell culture, right? It's not a yeah. single cell, it's a single cell culture. So then what does the interaction between different cell cultures mean in this context? I mean, you can consider interactions within a single cell culture, right, within the cells, but also across. And across, it's not quite clear what we get from here. Yeah. Sorry. So the interactions aren't modeled from between the distributions themselves. Um, then, the, so the interactions between cells. So the interaction aspect is see, see. Part of it. It's only internal. But then yeah. uh, the flow is essentially still, it, it still evolves a single distribution then for a single cell culture. Yes, but conditioned on 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 its entirety, on the entire like I see, state, I see. initial state, and this is kind of so. So I'm glad you bring this up. It's not ideal in the sense because we're conditioning on just the initial state. This kind of imagination of the Washstein manifold doesn't kind of come out perfectly, but but the the general theory allows for it. If this makes sense. Yeah, I see. It's it, it's it's really cool. If you would have some intermediate data to regularize your flow. In some mechanistic yeah, way, it but would be yeah, cool. thank you. Maybe when the data comes. So I guess this is another big caveat is, you know, we can develop all these cool methods, but to do something practical, we always depend on the data itself. Um, so as data comes, we can kind of adapt and improve, which is amazing. But uh, for now, we we leave it at this um, till we get these improved data sets over time. But maybe there's other applications where we can show this use case over 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 different time points rather than just two. But sorry, yeah. just cool. I had a quick question, yeah. um, probably quite a high level one, and no, yeah. don't want to uh, be too repetitive. But um, no is, is um, MFM custom designed for cases where you have interactions among the simulated uh, entities, or is that just a particularly useful case of this multi, um, like multitask learning? Uh, by entities, do you mean do you mean particles or cells? What do you what do you mean by entities? Uh, yeah, the the cells in this case. Um, so it can be more general. So it, so, uh, kind of this, what we show in this example or in our paper is we show these two examples of like, or we saw ablations over this parameter K, which represents, you know, how many edges we consider in the interactions. Um, 
because we consider this one architecture, we can consider no interactions and some interactions or various degrees of interactions, but you're not hinged on this architecture. So as you change the architecture, you can, you can do different things, although the architecture will define how you learn the embedding. So the, so the architecture I'm describing here is this fee, this, uh, um, this architecture for the uh, population embedding model. Um, yeah. So based on that, you kind of have flexibility to do different things. So it's not specifically tailored towards our, our biological example, but it's inspired by it in a sense. If that okay. answers your question. Yes, thanks. Cool. I have okay. a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, are subcultures obtained from the same patient uh, considered to have the same initial condition or different initial condition in this case? Here we also consider different initial conditions because they're also kind of in different, you can think of them as being in different, um, um, not exactly dishes, but like the like division of, of the populations. They're, they're individual populations. So if you have kind of four populations in one Petri dish, um, one of them will be independent of the other is, is the idea. Um, yeah. And then not yeah. independent. So it's kind of the replicated experiments within each patient um, is its initial condition. Again, using the argument that it's unlikely that any given cell population will be identical to the other one, even if it's the same cell type and on the same dish. Okay, thank you. All right, let's keep going. Okay. Maybe we can hold additional questions for the next thank slide. So this is probably, I'll, after this, I think I have some results and then we're almost done. Um, so okay, okay. Looking good. So just to give you really quick pseudocode of training. Um, again, we have algorithm the paper, but maybe this slightly simplifies it. Um, we have this data sets. Uh, or we have a data set where we have n um, experiments or n coupled populations, and we want to learn the velocity or the vector field, and we want to learn a population embedding model um, that we can condition the vector field on. And so at every iteration, we randomly sample a batch of these coupled experiments or coupled joint marginals, and then we also sample um, a batch of samples from each of these marginals and, and time points to interpolate on. And then given these samples, um, for instance, for population index i, we can learn, we then uh, get our embeddings that we call h here um, using our population embedding module, which is some latent representation of the entire distribution of samples. And this, as I described, is some permutation invariant architecture that lets us, lets us do this for different batches of cells or particles. And then we compute the loss, again, using, using our MFM objective, where our vector field conditions on, on these uh, uh, population embeddings. And then lastly, we can jointly update the parameters. Now, in practice, the way we do this, we actually alternate the updates between our vector field model and in our population embedding model every iteration. And this, this seems to converge fine. Um, although maybe we can, uh, I, think, I think Brandon very early on explored doing this jointly and we had some challenges. So we found that this works the best is when we alternate um, the two, which kind of makes sense because it's kind of some sort of bi-level optimization. Um, Sorry, just just a quick question. Um, I yes. was wondering, as far as I understand, you learn the embeddings during the full matching, um, yeah. but you are saying that you're actually using the permutation invariant uh, function or architecture. And I was wondering why not actually learning the permutation equivariant? Is it actually possible? Did you look into that? Um, like, sorry, you mean like in addition to permutation invariant, permutation equivariant? We did, exactly. I don't think so, so just completely that. replace the permutation invariance because it kind of imposes some rigidity, right? For a flexible solution, which is permutation equivariant. Is it possible to learn it at all? Maybe. So I don't know much about permutation equivariance. Um, maybe this is so, so it, 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 you're saying it's more flexible than inver permutation invariance? I mean, conceptually it should be, right? Because you kind of embed the residue index or whatever, the cell index in your data set, right? And if you kind of can uh, abstract from that, this will be right. cool. Yeah, maybe this is another possible avenue of future investigation. Completely reasonable, um, but I think it makes sense. But no, we we didn't explore this in detail, Mark. We didn't explore this. Um, we stayed in this invariant setting to try to get things to operate the way uh, we believe they should. Um, any other questions on training? Um. Yes. I just wanted to um, <laughs> note to the previous uh, note that I guess if you are running GNN with uh, residual connections, then in a sense, uh, you will get preserved identity on digital cells, but it will not be like uh, super preserved, but right. <laughs> to, yeah. Right, okay, I think I understand. 
And this would again enforce would like in, in the setting of permutation equivariance is what you're describing. Yeah, I just think that transformer is uh, well, it can be viewed as permutation equivariant, right? Because uh, mm. it, through residual, residual connections, you yeah. can uh, and position including you can uncover and. and yeah, so this is something I think is very reasonable to explore. And actually, like I'm in extending this work or trying to think about how to extend this work, a transform architecture has made the most sense, especially given like in these like um, foundation models in, in single cell biology, um, SCGPT is a transformer based architecture. So it makes a lot of sense in this in this reality. Um, again, not explored in this work, but I think completely reasonable to to explore in the future. So all good points. Cool. Cool. Um, and again, just a high level overview of what this looks like is you kind of have this population embedding module for different entire populations, which I'm denoting by different colors. And then we can, we can condition on, on, um, this entire population, but also we can add any other different condition, um, that I'm denoting here as C. So this in our case is like the treatment. So we're seeing the same treatments across different patients, across different populations. So you can additionally have this conditional, um, um, response to these treatments while we're conditioning on the entire population. So, um, just, just in as, as in a, you know, high level representation of what we're doing or what this model is. So, doing. so back to this, like a uh, foster sign manifold thing, it's like, we're learning a vector field on this manifold per yeah. treatment is what's going on. Essentially. Okay. Yeah. 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 With the condition. And for any such treatment, then if we like fix this C, then it just becomes a thing conditioned on H, which is just like conditioned on where we are starting from on this manifold. Yeah. Okay. Precisely. Nice. Okay. So now we can get into some results and I'll probably spend more time on the synthetic setting because it's a nice uh, visualization of how things work. Um, and then I'll kind of show results really quickly about on the, on the real data. Um, so we wanted to show a use case where we can visually see this and where we kind of have idealized conditions to show where MFM operates or how it operates. So we want to create this data set of these joint couple distributions. Um, and to do this, we first define a set of predefined target distributions, um, which we define on silhouettes of letters, what we're calling silhouettes of letters, where essentially we kind of sample a bunch of points or particles on these, on these letter shapes. Um, and then what we do is to get these couple distributions, we simulate the forward diffusion process and just noise the samples. And we kind of get these noisy uh, realizations of the letters. And this way we know that that P0 and P1 are coupled together. And now the question is, can we reverse this process? And we train, we wanna train models to try to reverse this process such that they're conditioned on um, the initial distribution. And the argument is, if you don't condition the initial distribution, then we're not gonna be able to properly denoise um, on, on these letters. And uh, maybe I stop here first. Um, any, any questions on the setup for the static example? So there's no treatment here, right? There's no, it's a fixed exactly. forward noising process. Yeah. So here, if we go back to what I showed here, this, we're not using, there's no C. So we're just conditioning on the population embeddings just to keep the okay. things simple in the, in the toy, in the aesthetic example. And then I guess on one training, thing, can, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I guess one like possible extension is you could just consider noising with different diffusions and make that your That's treatment. A good point, actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry, keep going. Yeah, because then you have these additional conditions. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, but yeah, so in this case, no no treatments, um, just to keep things uh, simple and and under, like very clear um, to the reader in a sense that, that, that things operate the way they should. Um, and we're training on 24 different letters and we, we want to generalize to these unseen populations. So what we do is we leave out um, the Ys and Xs or just Y and X. And we have 10 orientations of every letter um, and our model never sees um, the Y and X silhouettes. And then for training, um, we have again, uh, Y and X in 10 different orientations. So the idea is we wanna try to generalize here. And the first thing we wanna do is we wanna try the very naive model, which is, okay, no conditions what, whatsoever. We just take the aggregate populations and see if we can, if we can fit our, our data. And um, the reality with this kind of approach is we can neither generalize and we can neither even fit the training data. And you can kind of see, if you look at um, a time one that, that you know we're kind of making our, our letters kind of circular in a sense that, that our model is trying to learn this average over all the all the populations but in general we we don't fit the training data and we also don't generalize to the unseen letters so in this case i'm showing the y's 
And then what we want to see is, you know, you know, we want to show that the training data and the test data are sufficiently different, so that there is a generalization problem here uh, um, in general. And to do this, we kind of have the secondary naive approach that we call conditional generative flow matching, the conditions on uh, perfect conditions. So this is, let's say we know the population indices, these I's, and we can condition on them directly. So when we're in the letter D, uh, rotation one, we know the index, and we represent this as one hot encodings. And the reality of this model is it's never going to see the one hot encodings for the letters in the unseen test conditions. And because of that, it can't generalize. But we do see that it can fit the training data. And what I'll show in a table on a couple of slides is the training data is sufficiently different um, than test data or that there is some performance gap that we can achieve by conditioning the entire population. So, so you can't just fit this naive conditional model to try to generalize. And you can kind of see in the visual example that these Ys are not, not getting denoised, but not only are they not getting denoised, they're kind of getting kind of morphed in a sense. So there's something weird going on um, in this aspect, but things don't work as expected. Um, any questions on this setup? Because it's kind of an intermediate model to kind of not really compare to, but show show as a sanity check that things operate as they, they should. And it's kind of nice because you kind of see that the D and the E are getting denoised um, the way we, we, we would like to see it. Um, so the CGFM basically uh, has to work with, uh, sorry, actually, there, there was a question from uh, Vessel Valod. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just simply interesting because um, in the test at the time point one, you can see that there is some sort of a clustering of the, uh, yeah. you know, the samples, right? So that's pretty interesting. Do you have any suspicion why did it happen? I do not. I, I, I think it is pretty interesting. I think... Originally, what we expected is maybe this should perform better than, um, like at least numerically, should perform better than the very naive approach where we just have the aggregate response and it didn't. Um, I think because we're feeding essentially like this, these unseen conditions are essentially garbage to the model because it's never seen. So I wonder if, in a sense, simply just because we're giving it this complete outer distribution condition, it just struggles to 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 generalize in this setting. It's never seen these paths, right? In a sense, but I, other so than that, I really have a very all right, go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, what what solver are you using? Uh, we're using a uh, joint, if I recall. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah, RK. No, no, a joint. I can, I can, I can get back to you on that. I'm trying to remember. I tried a couple solvers and I converged on one, but I think we're using the joint method. No, it's all right. I can look up if it's someone. Yeah, it's also in the code. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I, I have an expression. So this is yes. like. Rungikuta fourth order, or is just like earlier? A joint is for like another thing, but it doesn't matter. Just like standard numerical OD solver. And the clustering is just the like artifact of the initial condition rather than something that model learned because we could put any letter in it and then it would just like we apply the learned vector field to it and then it does something to the samples. So the final form really depends more on the initial condition. Yes. I see, thanks. Right. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. And that brings us to MFM, where we kind of see that things sort of work. Um, maybe not ideally, but we have an improvement to these naive approaches. Um, to the aggregate response in this 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 one hot conditional model, and this is kind of a satisfying result because it shows that you know maybe these assumptions or that these assumptions make some sense and that there is something to learn that is relevant and that we're able to learn these distribution conditional responses um, and generalize across these unseen distributions of population. And to kind of show some numbers is we see that we have some improvement relative to these baselines, and we also look at this model that um, these kind of four models in the middle that we we generate from a, a standard Gaussian the data, but we still condition on the structure distribution. Um, so we, we learn an embedding model given the initial populations, but the generative part is done using just a Gaussian. And this is just kind of to show that you kind of need the structure in these 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 samples, uh, these examples to, to learn this response. Um, you can see this by the performance being significantly worse if we're not actually starting at our, um, at our source distributions, at the correct source distributions. Um, although in the biological case, this isn't as true, which is a cool observation um, in a different sense. So any questions? How on sensitive do you think? 
Yeah. I was going to ask how sensitive do you think this training procedure is to the like the number of pairs that you start with? Like in this case, since you train on like the twenty six uh, oh. kind of um, these twenty six letters, and then you kind of you or you hold out two for your test set. Like maybe in a different world, you we have like this kind of like size a thousand alphabet that you can train on, or maybe you just yeah, synthesize yeah. like fake characters from like on beyond Z by Dr. Seuss and you train on those or something. Um, yeah. like, do you think you'd actually do much better? Or do you think most of the generalization already happens with these 26? So phenomenal. I think this is a great question. We didn't have, we don't have it in the current version of the paper, but I'm adding it to the next version. Um, and the answer is you do improve a little bit, um, as you increase the number of populations you train on. And we kind of, I added this ablation on um, the blue curve being MFM and the red curve being FM. And if you look at the the right two columns are X's and Y's. We kind of see there is a saturation, well, sort of a saturation point. Maybe I have to do more populations. Um, for example, that you know, you know, we're operating somewhere in between, um, um, kind of two to around two to the seven to two to the eight. Um, but you can get more performance if you increase the amount of training populations. Uh, but at some point, you are saturating. I think in Washington two, you you saturate um, faster and than one, and then MMD similar. I don't. You know, maybe, maybe if I keep going for bigger populations, it keeps going down, but I just kind of maxed out my GPU. Um, I see. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm interested because it seems like the space of like things that look like fake letters is like combinatorially large and like mm. kind of maybe it's only some like small subspace of this uh, Wasserstein manifold, but it's still like the actual English letters are only like some really sparse corner of this larger space. And if we want to generalize across this manifold, I mean, maybe we define the manifold of things we care about to just be these English letters, but. Yeah, no. but I think in general, I think you're correct. As you as you go to like, if you go to infinite different objects or different two D kind of distributions in in our sp in our defined space, you're seeing almost everything. In which case, you should be able to generalize. Um, so there's an argument to be made that as we keep increasing the number of populations, or not even just increasing the number of populations in our setup, but increasing the the different structures, that we're gonna get better performance. So maybe we go to numbers or lowercase letters, so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, I think. And this is kind of the motivation of doing this ablation is, you know, I think that's a completely reasonable question that we didn't do originally. And this kind of justifies that we're kind of in a reasonable regime. Um, but yeah, as we increase the standard, like machine learning, deep learning intuition applies that more data equals more generalization. Yeah, more good data equals more generalization, I would say, um, in this sense, or more data oh, applied awesome. to the data set. How did you actually define these trained populations in the case of letters? Um, what, what's the definition of, of one population? What sets it apart from a different one? Um, so the only differences will be the rotation. So we randomly, it's just a random set of rotations um, around its center. Okay, um, but have define, you ever you checked know, whether whether your model then overfits on the simulation study? That's that's a reasonable. So this is the reason, yeah, in a sense, we kind of, you know, have the train and test for this reason. So in, in some aspect, yeah, maybe we're overfitting. Um, so maybe it's worth exploring better training. Uh, more how to regularize this so that we're not overfitting. But yeah, that's a that's a good point. But I think in general, we are getting some generalization. Yes, the gap between train and test is kind of big, but uh, you also, we don't, you know, the, the, the metrics on different letters is also a thing to perceive, which I'm not sure. So if we train on Ys, I don't know what the actual number would look like on, on, on Y and Xs, um, so on and so forth. But... I think maybe it's reasonable to to look at you know overfitting, but I don't know if we look at the ablation, um, in a sense, um, you know, it, as, as we increase the number of training examples, you can see the training evaluation metric goes up. Um, I don't know if this tells us anything, but yeah, maybe it's worth exploring deeper. Actually, so good point. What if you just could consider a certain letter, but like all the affine transformations of this one letter, so that the the space of things you care about is like a connected family on this thing, or is like Oh, mm. Did anybody just see those balloons on my screen? So they're um, like, as is, it seems like there's like a discon, like the A's are over here and then like the B's are all the way over here. And it's like, there's all this space on this statistical manifold that like right. kind of our models having to become an expert here and an expert here and maybe the C's and the D's, but these are like totally very far apart in kind of on this, on this manifold. And so there's kind of this discontinuity in the like data provided right. that maybe is hurting or maybe maybe the model would do even better uh, if we just restrict it to just like these, like kind of continuous 100%. family of transformations of a single letter. I agree. I think I think the idea was we wanted to make it sufficiently hard 
because the actual application, we don't actually know the difficulty, but it's arguably difficult to generalize across different patients. Right. So it's, it's um, actually pretty impressive that it kind of it actually does manage yeah. to kind of cross these gaps. It's yeah, pretty cool. I, you know, the pattern is usually you try to push the model as far as you can and then and see what happens. You know, originally what we actually tried and kind of, it's actually like the case where we have um, no rotation. So just 24 letters or 25 letters and leave out Y. And we, we, we couldn't really generalize and kind of make sense. There isn't a lot of data. So I think our, our solution was, you know, add more data and it, and it worked. So we didn't have to make the problem easier in this sense. So it is impressive. I agree. I think this is a very cool and surpri not surprising, but very cool results that um, kind of our intuition applies and works in a, in a difficult setting, even in a difficult synthetic setting, um, as you said. But yeah, you can simplify the problem. You can consider just A's. And let's say you consider just A's and you just leave out some rotations and A's that, that the model never sees. And that would be a significantly more simpler uh, generalization problem. Um, as, as you um, yeah, j just maybe a tiny question. Have you also maybe instead of using rotations, just used uh, different uh, initial noising uh, schedulers? So essentially, just yes. add <laughs> more or less noise. Yeah. So i I don't have a I don't have a figure for this, but I did run this a few months ago. Where as we change the noise, um, what happens to the performance and kind of what I expected to occur? And this is maybe not like. We don't have a data set of different noising levels, but we have this setup that I've described at different levels of noise. So kind of with little noise, you know, it's much easier to denoise so that the denoising tasks become easier. And with a lot of noise, there's no structure to learn some initial embedding from. So then it's hard to generalize because your kind of population embedding is meaningless in a sense. So this kind of trade-off between structure of the initial population and 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 um and your your generalization performance as well. But we didn't explore within one data set to different values of noise. I just looked at um, um, how noise affects this this result in general. If this answers your question, but you can you can kind of construct different versions of this, many different versions of this kind of data set in our setup. Yeah. And I think our okay. setup's Thank pretty you. easy to use, so you can actually like explore this yourself if you want uh, by messing around with the parameters. I would say, and changing yes, things. Thank you. Cool. Maybe I just summarize and uh, summarize the real biological data and um, show you some results with this. Um, as I mentioned, we want to kind of see if we can generalize across patients. And this data set has essentially an aggregate 2,500 different conditions um, um, over 10 patients and 11 different treatments, and then a bunch of replications and different cell cultures, or three different cell cultures, but a bunch of replicated experiments. Um, so we have about, in the patient split, we have about, I think, 800 different um, pairs of, of, of distributions and the replica split, which I'll describe, we have about 700 to 800 as well. So it's very comparable. And then we have about 100 um, um, to 300 left out test populations um, for the two splits respectively. So the replica split is just simply, um, we want to see if we leave out different replicas. So this, if you see in the top figure, um, the red is the test points or the test experiments. Um, so across all patients, we see um, populations and we just try to generalize across different replicas. And then the patient split, we just want to generalize across all the replicas in one patient. Um, and what we observe in a sense is that the difference in, 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 you know, to summarize, we see the MFM works much better or improves in performance on the test data here. But on the patient split, we have kind of an increased improvement in performance, maybe because this is a harder generalization task in the replica split. Uh, maybe not. Uh, maybe this requires more investigation. But in general, we kind of see this improved uh, uh, performance, rather, similar to our synthetic example, um, where conditioning on the population and modeling these interactions um, when k isn't zero um, is important in, in some instances or on some of these metrics to achieve generalization. Um, so k here is the number of. Yeah. Yeah, just one uh, more question. But are you only considering the same? Mm type of cell culture, or maybe you have also varying cell cultures by essentially the source of cancer over there. So varying biologically, meaning that, for example, you can have like, yeah, connective tissue or uh, some entirely other tissue, other type of tissue. Right. So one thing I can say is for the population embedding model, because we have two different cell types um, within the different cultures, we can also, we add a condition for, for um, cell type in the embedding module. Um, sure. but this, there's an argument to be made. This is itself represented in the population. So we don't need this, but you could condition on different cell cultures and cell types, but we don't, we don't really explore that here, but you could extend that to that if you want. 
um, at least at least in the uh, our MFM module. It might be. I mean, you can add different conditions to CGFM to account for this. Um, but in a similar sense, I think the data itself. You know, there's some cultures where you have both. So out of the three cultures, you have three setups. We have um, just cancer cells, just uh, or just fibroblasts, uh, PDO cancer cells in a combination. Um, just the nature of the data said they were studying kind of how these things uh, uh, interact, how how cancer cells and fibroblasts or PDO and fibroblasts um, affect you know when you have a treatment or how how the treatment affects when you have a joint versus not having them together. But we don't actually study this in this in this paper. We just kind of use the data as is to kind of show the generalization property um, when you condition on on the initial population. Sorry, this is probably a prolonged answer to your question, but uh, short no, answer. No, it's, we don't it, it's fine. Anything. Thank you. But so this this slash n thing this this means that we are assuming our starting condition is a normal is that yeah so the slash n I'm using the note so in the in these four models it's kind of just like we're we're our initial population during generation is um our initial samples during generation I should say are just coming from a standard normal but we're still conditioning on the initial population itself that has the structure which is not generating from that initial population if this makes sense. Oh, so okay. Like, so even during training, it's it's we're. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're still conditioning on the original population, but yeah. we are conditioning to learn a bridge always from a Gaussian. Yeah, correct. Target. Oh, okay, okay. Right. I was confused when I first read that. This makes sense now. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, it's, um, I was trying to find a concise way to put this. It's uh. No, no, it, it's it's on me. I I uh, I just I must have skipped over something. But that makes that um, totally but, makes sense now. Yeah, notably to to observe this though, you kind of see in the test results. Uh, my cursor doesn't work on this presentation mode, but if you look at like W one on test here, you can kind of see like improvements when you. you, you there's not much gain for using popula the original population to generate from. Ar arguably, and maybe maybe that's because there isn't that much structure in the actual distribution. Um, and if I've, I've looked at like it's hard to do this because you can look at two two dimensional embeddings or principal components of this, but you know, there's kind of arguments to be made that that's not the best thing to do. So it's kind of hard to describe. Um, or to observe your data. And this is maybe one thing to check that your data is not necessarily that structured, if you will. But maybe that's not the case. But in some sense, it kind of, you can see in the letters example, there's a big difference, whereas here there isn't a big difference. Um, um, but nonetheless, yeah. And sorry, you had a question so about the case as... parameter? Oh, uh, I did. I, I have a more interesting question, maybe. It was okay. just that Please. as soon as we start from N, yeah. the whole kind of Wasserstein and vector field thing goes out the window. So we're just starting from a single point. Is that... Yeah. Uh, I don't think so because we're still conditioning on P0. Like we're still learning an embedding module on, on our initial population and conditioning on that. So you still have a condition on the initial distribution, but you know, you kind of have an additional initial distribution that you generate from. So maybe, yeah, maybe there's something to be said there. Maybe that's not trivial. I don't have a good answer for this. Um, but I wonder if all you need to operate in the Washington manifold is the condition of the initial population. But yeah, I guess this decoupling of we're not actually generating our trajectory from P0, we're generating from a Gaussian might change this. That's a good point, but I'm not sure to be honest. Um, okay. but and then but... my second question was just um, about K. K is the number of things we're training on or the number of... Um... I just I must have just missed this on the previous. Yeah, slide. so K is so because we're the GNN we're using is just a graph convolution network, and we're using a yeah. K nearest neighbor's edge pooling layer. Oh, gotcha. Okay, right. Which right, is right. the Canyon okay. parameter. So, okay, so K is hundred. So our population is like a thousand. Is that what the paper said? Yeah. So I think the batch size I use here is like a thousand cells at a time. So the cells, like the populations, range from like a thousand cells to thirteen thousand cells. Um, oh, I see. Okay. And we batch them, so I think I use about a thousand. 1024 something like this and then like 512 for the letters um so you can both batch how many populations um you sample at a time um so you can do batch learning on populations and we also do batch learning on the cells so two batches um to kind of make things slightly more confusing but yeah uh, helps helps with conversions and all that gotcha uh, sorry off topic um i guess this is a keynote presentation so if you press control c you will have the pointer, I guess. Amazing. Can you <laughs> yeah. do that? Thank you. I've learned something. This is awesome. Sure, Thank no you worries. so much. I didn't know that. That's great. Cool. What is it? Control C? Control C does yeah. it. Yeah. Damn. And then you press it again. It goes away. Cool. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. And then that kind of brings us to our conclusions that I could go over. Um, but in general, 
yeah, thanks for your guys' attention. Um, this was great. Thanks for inviting me to talk and happy to answer any more questions. And big acknowledgement. Yeah, thank you so much, Lazar. Collaborators. Everyone's been phenomenal on this project. It was honestly a pleasure to work on. Um, and thanks for all the great questions. I have a question. I have one question. Um, yes. So when we think about the paper talks about um, modeling this as a vector field on this foster sign manifold, and mm -hmm. we construct this tangent space as like uh, as flows, which are like pointwise gradients of scalar potentials. Is there any reason to suspect that the flow that we would learn by flow matching is actually of this form? Sorry, can you say that again? Um... Uh, okay, so so um, we consider we construct this uh, manifold of uh, of our distributions, yeah. Um, this Foster sign manifold, and then we say that tangent space at any particular thing looks like kind of like I can perturb with any vector field that's the gradient of a scalar potential, right? Okay, um, and then do we know that? Um, and then, and then when we actually train, we use flow matching, which gives us some flow. But is there any guarantee that this flow given by flow matching, which is like this expectation over our kind of interpolating paths, mm. is is of this form? Um, I'm not sure. I wonder, this sounds like a bridge to action matching, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't know if Kirill's in the room. Maybe he was. He would be better to answer this question. But I think maybe... But I don't know what assumptions we need to make for this to be true on like the flow matching aspect um, in the vector field. Uh, it could be possible. I'm not sure though. Okay, all right. I'm not to... an expert in this. I mean, in the like kind of. Yeah, yeah you're good. Yeah, no worries. I just, um, if anyone, if anyone has any ideas, I'd be potential. curious. Uh, otherwise, a little otherwise... far. Yeah, but it's a good question. Yeah, it makes me think of action matching in a sense where you're kind of parameterizing the energy rather than the 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 vector field but uh yeah if yeah Kirill if you you know maybe maybe follow up with us this is an interesting question and maybe there's a follow up on doing this um in a different way to to, to make sure that works but I'm not sure to be honest sorry I can give a more concrete answer ah no worries um, oh uh what was that Lars you said you I can answer the question. Oh yeah, do you do? You, can you? It, it sounds like we could use action matching for something like this, but I'm not. I'm not sure. For the, uh, I mean, <clears throat> for for action matching, you have to just like define any transformation, but you can do conditioning on the distribution. I think the whole paper is about to like more kind of like representation learning of distributions, yeah. conditioning on these representations, rather than like particular diffusion path or interpolation between distributions. So I would consider it more like really a representation learning of distributions. It's like, I don't know, in some sense, you can imagine that this, you can do something like stable diffusion where you encode, decode, like you, you train a, a not encoder for distributions, and then you do everything in the Latin space of these things. Mm. Uh, but oh, we, we, as last step, we didn't explore like training a separate encoder or decoder. Maybe that answers your question, but yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. That that um, I'll have to keep thinking about it. But that did that did help. Um, All right. I had a question, um, but yes. it's rather something exploratory. So you had a very kind of dedicated data set, which was well curated, let's say. Uh, so this is an ideal world scenario. But as far as I understand, like um, your heterogeneity of the samples and the probability distributions of your data point. Um, will highly depend on the genetic background of a patient, on the age, whatsoever. Like it's a, the whole manifold of uh, different settings which you have to kind of take into consideration implicitly. Um, do you think the generalization capability on the real world data where, you know, you have different conditions of experiments and different conditions of, of patients will, will still hold true? Um, That's a great question. So I think... There's something to be explored here. So even in like one patient in different batch, like having replicated experiments in one patient, there's a question to be explored there because you know we kind of show this replica example, which kind of approximates that. But 
it's not really well understood how, you know, even different processing. So you can correct batch effects, which people do a lot to analyze single cell data. But to my understanding, when you do this, you kind of lose some of the heterogeneity that exists that you don't want to lose. And then your generalization gets messed up. Um, in a similar sense, um, you know, how you partition your data set and your different cell types and these, these examples can change your generalization. So even different partitions affect this. I'm not sure, you know, how this extends to when you have any arbitrary set of data sets. I think my view, and maybe this is just a view, this isn't very like a hard um, scientific, well, this is my view in general is, I think there's enough heterogeneity between patients, even if it's the same, like, like one, one person um, at the same age or like 10 different people all at the same age coming from similar, I don't know, uh, 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 backgrounds, let's say. I think there's enough heterogeneity in their states um, in life that, that like due to life that, that there will be enough heterogeneity to generalize in different data sets. Um, I think it's a reasonable argument, um, but you know, maybe, maybe not. I don't think there's a, like scientific examples. As you said, this is exploratory. I would say it's worth exploring in a sense. But again, we're kind of hinged on getting more data to explore this. Um, I think there's more and more large data sets coming out that have um, these kind of coupled setups of marginals over many replications or different donors um, that we can now start using to explore this. But as of now, I think this is one of the first data sets I know that let us even look into this. I don't know if this answers have your you question. Ever computed, uh, sorry, sorry. Have you ever computed the Wasserstein distances between uh, two replicas among the same patient, like how, how different they are. That's a very good point. I think we did very briefly at one point, but, and and there were not that, uh, I'm trying to remember if we did this for patients or letters. Um, I think we did on yes, patients. For, for letters, briefly. it's different. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I think we did this on patients because there's no point to do it on letters. And I think it was very small, but like this was very early on. So I don't think we approach what the difference is, um, the true like differences between two pay. Yeah, I, you know, maybe what we should do is we should normalize against that uh, that 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 wash time metric as you described, because it's a good point because you kind of describe heterogeneity. But this is actually, you know, in an extension, I'm trying to look into this is I think it's rarely relevant to define, at least on the biological side of these problems. It's important to define how heterogeneous your data really is if you want to approach something like this. Um, and to this end, this is where we're actually going to try to explore kind of computing the wash time metric or other metrics that like model or represent the diversity or the heterogeneity within the samples, because that's a very good point. Um, in this, in this paper, we didn't do that. Um, or at least we didn't report it um, or do it well enough to report it. I should say. Cool. Yes. But yeah, very good uh, I have a couple of questions about yep. the choice of embedding model first. So you're using GLM uh, to encode essentially a holistic representation of the distribution and use it to poise uh, the uh, flow matching process. So can you use instead something simpler that uh, essentially just pulls the data without a QNN structure at all, just, uh, for example, embeds uh, individual cells and then uh, sums them up or right. whatever, like, <laughs> so the very it doesn't simple have to be GLM. Yeah, so the very simple, so like the K equals zero, yeah, we're using the GNN architecture, GCN architecture, but it's really just a deep sets architecture. So it's like an MLP architecture that enforces the permutation of variance. You could go simpler, but if you go to just like an MLP, then you don't capture the permutation of variance. So this could be a problem. So the deep sets is, I think, the simplest we can go while we can also still learn a representation for the entire population. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, I guess my confusion was because I was thinking that the uh, signal that we use to poise uh, that flow matching is actually a vector, but you imply that this is in dimensionality of cells. Uh, so the embedding, so this H, you're talking about this. Yeah, H. That is, it is a vector. It is a vector, but then uh, a vector would be invariant with respect to cells, right? It, it, if, if it is not, uh, like, I guess its dimensionality is independent on the number of cells, no? It's just a fixed, fixed size embedding of the population. I so, sorry if... <laughs> no, no worries. I think it's a, like a very good question to ask. I don't think necessarily it will be invariant to the cells. I think I think it will kind of represent the distribution as a whole. It's just that the input as we ban as we sample more cells, we need the permutation invariance, right? So that if we sample a different batch of cells, we're still capturing the population or the distribution as a whole. 
um, rather than thinking it's a separate condition or a separate embedding. Um, so in this sense, we kind of sell sample from the same population have similar embeddings in this sense. Okay, um, okay. I, I understand that this is maybe, just I don't a know, maybe way I'm to do your question. I guess my point was that uh, if you just use summation, if you first encode cells in a batch and then you just sum or aggregate yeah. them average, then it would be kind of the same. But uh, yeah, but uh, this is just first question, but the second kind of continuous on it, can you, instead of using this um, encode first and use encoding signal to do ki some kind of guidance uh, in the evolution process, can you um, just uh, maybe change the architecture of the model that is running the flow matching itself. So essentially merge them, fuse them. Yeah, I thought about this. This is kind of guided um, guided diffusion in a sense. Um, I thought about this yeah. um, and, uh, you know, Alex, who's also in this paper, has also thought about this in the past. And we've had conversations about kind of diffusion and guidance for, for kind of cell type or like perturbations. And I think this is a reasonable, we haven't explored this. I think you could. I think you have to change the setup slightly. But in general, I think it's a reasonable thing to explore because then you can maybe learn a separate model, maybe a foundation model or a separate model that kind of embeds your conditions, your populations. Um, it doesn't have to be populations. It can also be perturbations if you can learn embeddings for your perturbations. And then you can guide your vector field model that way. I think that's a completely reasonable approach um, to this and yeah. it's something I'm yeah. definitely interested in, in the future. Um, so I think that's like, a very good point to bring up. For me, what is the most exciting about this whole field is actually to go a bit deeper into uh, development, developmental biology. So essentially right. trying to control the process of differentiation of different cells. And then you'll yeah. have to use uh, data sets that contain multiple cell types and uh, probably maybe even data sets that are sampled like uh, in vivo. So different time points from the same person. And then maybe it is possible to use as uh, essentially conditioning class labels, cell type identities, uh, and try to see how you can get from one cell type to another cell, cell type and what kind of uh, possible transition paths that exist. That would be yeah, like- I, I think it's a completely cool direction to explore. I, I think I, I've thought about this, I think maybe not my domain of expertise in the biology side for sure, but this kind of, this example on the right here, this kind of developmental um, in the spatial domain is maybe what, you could be interested in um, where you kind of have different cell types and you want to see how they develop over time, but they're yes, also yes. specifically related. So, you know, if you're interested That's in that- That's also you know, why I was asking before, because here the idea is that you kind of stratify your data uh, by distributions, by these populations based on mm -hmm. the spatial proximity, right? But uh, you can also try to uh, essentially cluster them and just uh, make uh, yeah. heuristic ad hoc populations uh, and try to evolve essentially like the same similarly looking cell cells. But I'm not sure that this is reasonable. I just yeah. I think if Doron is still here, um, he's working on very similar stuff. Maybe he's a good person to talk to if you're interested in this. Um, I don't know if he's still listening, but yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Um, this ideas yeah. of working with point clouds of spatial domains is like very very much in development and it's i mean we're trying to do stuff with it uh but it's maybe more similar to some of the questions you were asking about um i told us this but i think the spatial transcriptomics field in particular which is what he shows here on the right is like particularly ripe for these types of explorations working with distributions working with point clouds working in the wasserstein domain um so definitely something to think about Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually was uh, was asking about non-spatial transcriptomics where you just extract essentially uh, like from a large holistic data set, you extract different cell populations. So for example, you can extract T cells and B cells and fibroblasts. And uh, by using this kind of clustering, you can try to also model um, essentially some kind of quotient interactions between the cell groups, between the identities of different cell types within a single organism in vivo. But yeah, I, 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 I just saying this because I am not that familiar with spatial transcriptomics. I, I know that the data is exponentially accumulating, but I think it's still probably less than in abundance than uh, a regular I think, single cell. I think what you're 
considering here is like standard velocity models to try to see some sort of like dynamics between these different groups. Um, the it's like it's less interesting right now for us to say, oh, does a B cell transform into a T cell or something to that effect? I think some of like the problems that Lazar here was trying to solve, which is like you see some population before perturbation, then you enact a perturbation, you see a different population. How did you get from A to Z? Is the mm -hmm. current like big problems that optimal transport is particularly poised to answer? Um, that's at least how I see it. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I do think it's curious to consider like some sort of relationships within populations uh, and how do we get yeah. there? Uh, like my question is entirely motivated by biology, to be honest. Like because uh, yeah, yeah. for actual uh, investigation of what happens in a person, often actually disease prediction and uh, like prognosis is done based on just basically uh, fractions and ratios of uh, different cell types. For example, even this can uh, say you a lot. So kind of. Emergent yeah. global signals that are not within a single cell, but across cell groups. Uh, it's it, yeah. it is also an important signal. But yeah, okay, I, I see your point. I think, I, I think on that is like, and I think in your conversation you're trying to get at this, like embedding and understanding how like cells work as population. It's kind of like the opposite of what we're doing in the single cell field, right? Like we had bulk, and then we're like, okay, bulk isn't good enough, so we're going to look at like cells individually, and now we're saying, okay, so we have individual cells what is the uh, um, like holistic or emergent property that we get? So it's like trying to get some sort of like sample level understanding. Um, but this is like, you know, stuff like metaflow matching stuff, like just figuring out what are like the correct architectures and ways to like embed populations. So we could like do some compar comparisons and contrast there. It's a massive, massive open problem. And it's like some of the like recent things that we're trying to think about in the single cell field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really exciting. Thank you for answering. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Are there, Thanks. is anyone have any other questions? Alrighty. Lazar, thank you so much uh, for presenting yeah, today. This was great. Um, and yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you so much. Great work, Lazar. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Don. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care, everybody. Take care.